We are so fortunate to live in a community with so many conservation areas that reflect the natural beauty of our open spaces, woodlands, and coastal habitat. In just a few minutes, we're going to take you on an adventure to one of those places that hopefully you'll go back and visit someday. Welcome to Trails of Discovery with your hosts, Bob Mellers and, and Sky Thaxter. Trails of Discovery is a series that explores the natural resources that exist practically in your backyard here in Hingham and our surrounding communities. Let's start with a visit to the Laner property located on South Pleasant Street in Hingham uh, with limited parking near the entrance. The Laner property is 56 acres in size and comprised of grasslands, mixed forest, wetlands, and streams, and abuts other protected lands. Everyone in town knows it is the potter's field, or a public burial place for paupers and unknown people. The sloping meadow off South Pleasant Street looks much the same as it did when Hans Lerner bought the parcel in the 1920s. He was a cotton grader for a British firm. He and his wife came to Boston just before World War I, but settled in Hingham, which was much more rural then. He was looking for some place like southern Germany. Hans Lehner enlarged his property parcel by parcel. When he died in 1964, his sons Philip and Peter Lehner inherited the house and the land. Philip and Monique Lehner moved into the house. After Philip Lerner died in 2013, the property was put into a family trust for the brothers' ten children. To help us explore this area today, we have Steve Ivis, who is a wetland scientist and naturalist. Well, thanks for having me today, Bob. We've got a clear, crisp, cool day. To start today, Let's look at that red bush over there. It looks like it has red berries on it. Well, Bob, I love to be out on a day like this with the leaf off. It's the leaf off season. And when, when the leaves are off, you can see a lot more around. If we stop here and take a look here, we've got a beautiful open field that's been cut. It's been cut every year. And it's frozen in the center here. And in the wetland and in the woodlands, it's not frozen. Uh, the wetland itself has a really interesting rush in it called soft rush. It shows up uh, almost anywhere you put a, a hole in the ground and put some water in uh, very quickly in the first season. And then it has sensitive fern in it as well, which is a, uh, a fern that only grows, or grows most of the time in a wetland situation with its roots extremely wet. Uh, what do you call this wetland here? Is there a name for it? Uh, the wetland is called, this one right here that we're in is a headwater wetland. It's actually right at the very highest elevation of an entire wetland system on this property, on the Lena property. So it's, it's the first time we see open water here and the open water moves down through the field. And we, if we look back here, we can see the lowest point in the field and it moves all the way down to the stone wall and that red maple swamp back there. We'll see that a little bit later. But right here we have winterberry and we don't see the berries of course in the summertime. Uh, it's, they're beautiful to see in the wintertime. They're also a really good wildlife habitat food. 
Uh, the birds and small mammals actually eat these berries as well. This particular thicket is very large. It's a very wide thicket. It's got some old um, stems. It's about 12 to 15 feet high, which is one of the biggest thickets I've ever seen. And it's growing out in the middle of, middle of the fields and, uh, and uh, next to a lawn area. Also here we have sensitive fern growing, which is a wetland fern. And we have the spore capsules. This, this is the uh, this is the seed a spore, um, the seed of the fern itself, that spreads quite quite often. Steve, it seems that the winter berry is growing right out of the water. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. And in fact, we are at a headwater wetland of this entire uh, part of of this entire system on the Lena property. Um, about two-thirds of the time, the, the common winterberry likes to be in water during the growing season. Uh, another plant that we saw in the water at, during the growing season is a cattail, uh, which we can take a look at in a few moments. Well, my feet are getting wet. I think we ought to head to higher ground. <laughs> All right. Hi, we've, we've found some puffball mushrooms in the field here, which I did not expect to see. Um, again, mushrooms that, can you see that? They're the spores of the mushrooms coming out right there. And we're, going, we're, we're creating more mushrooms next year. You see? There we are. Incredible numbers of spores. We're here on an old stone bridge in the middle of the field. And if we look up gradient, it's a very slight slope up toward the headwater wetland where the, the common winterberry are. And there's a sort of a center of a swale, basically a, a, a wide, uh, low ditch coming toward us, toward the cattails right here. And then if we go look down gradient toward the red maple swamp, we can still see that swale as well and it's outlined by some hydric grass species. Um, what we also have in this area is the soft rush, which uh, looks very dark colored in this area behind me and in front of me. Uh, rushes around and sedges have edges. Uh, next we're going to go up and take a look at the upland woodland. Great. Very good. Steve. We come upon a beautiful stone wall that has so many different colors. Uh, indeed, these are lichens. It's a symbiotic relationship between an algae and a fungus. And it's basically eating away the rock slowly, but it uses the rock for its nutrients. And we have a number of different species of lichen here. We've got a green color here. We've got a more of a grayish color here. We, I saw some black lichen here and here. Um, and, and we've got some, some golden rods in front of the rock here. And if we look back at the stone wall here, uh, and we look back and wonder where the stones came from, it looks like it came from that hillside behind us. And the hillside itself has a very steep slope. On natural slopes, are about 27 degrees maximum. Uh, this looks like a little bit steeper than that and these rocks probably came from there and the slope was probably used, the, the, the soil in the slope was probably used for fill and our next stop we'll take a look at a very interesting area where the slopes were filled uh, about six feet deep. Steve, these are really interesting trees. These trees grow in sunny situations, and we've got fantastic sun today. It's in a perfect situation. Look how straight it is and how, uh, how, how well it's growing here. These trees are also very re resistant to the salt, so we see a lot down by the ocean, uh, a lot in the salt dunes, in Marshfield, in Situate, and in Cohasset, and in Hingham. Um, we also have a little bit of green briar growing up on the tree here. I understand the bark 
of a cedar tree was used to make rope, mats, and baskets. That's, that's correct. You can strip the bark and it's extremely flexible. We're going to take a walk over here. I want, I've got something really interesting to show you. Great. So guys, we have an incredibly large filling of land here. We've got an upland woodland over to our easterly side. And we've got a stone wall that's built, and it's got to be four to five feet high here. And it runs for probably a couple of hundred feet from the south to the north. Who the heck would build it, and why would they fill all this property? There's a slope over there that we looked at earlier, where this, that other stone wall came from. But it's still a mystery to me while, why anybody would fill all this land. The amount of time and energy it took to do this must have been huge. There's a couple of other things I want to show you as well. There's a glacial erratic here in the, uh, in the woodland here. A uh, good sized boulder. It's got to be uh, six feet high and maybe ten feet wide. Just left there by the glacier. That's exactly right. When the glaciers uh, melted, the boulder came down and was just dropped right there. I don't think it's been moved since in the last 10,000 years or so. There's a couple of other things I'd like to show you as well. Um, this is called a winged euonymus plant. Uh, it's also called burning bush. Th yes, exactly. Um, it's an invasive. Um, it's, it's, it was brought in as a uh, landscape plant by some horticulturists back about 100 plus years ago but it's, it's becoming a very, very tough plant to eradicate. We've also got another plant that's around th this black cherry here. Uh, it's called Asian bittersweet, and it's going to eventually kill the tree. And the tree here has got an interesting deformity called a burl. You see a lot of um, bowls built from burls, carved actually from the burls. Let's take a right here onto this part of the trail. Hey Steve, is this the Asian bittersweet? Uh, no, it's not. It's, uh, it's actually a wild grapevine. The bittersweet itself takes down trees, and it's a, um, it's a very smaller, it's much smaller, usually, vine. These grapevines are huge. Take a, take a look at how many there are. Um, they don't usually take down trees. They don't wrap around trees. They just use the trees for support. Oftentimes, you'll uh, come out here in uh, late September and be able to smell the grapes that are actually there. I see an amazing uh, fuzzy vine growing up this tree. Ah, uh, well, Bob, I don't want you to hug that tree. You know what that is? That's poison ivy. And notice all the little rootlets on the vine. And then as we look up the tree, those aren't tree branches. Those are poison ivy branches. Poison ivy has three forms. There's a ground running form. It's a herbaceous story. Um, then it's, it's got the vine form that goes up trees, and closer to the ocean, it has a shrub form that's about eye height. And it's, it's nothing we want, to, uh, we want to encourage on our properties. Well, I'm not a fan of poison ivy, so I'll stay away. Okay. Let's continue down the trail this way.
We're here in a scrub shrub wetland and the wetland actually has a groundwater discharge point about 200 feet up gradient of where we are. Behind me is a little stream with a nice sandy bottom that's come out of the, the groundwater discharge area which is close to a white pine forest uh, behind uh, Main Street in Hingham. Uh, what we have is a lot of shrubs here. We also have sphagnum moss, that moss that was used for baby diapers by the Native Americans, which is right in front of me here. We have skunk, skunk cabbage in this wetland that we're seeing. We are just seeing the little points of skunk cabbage coming up, which has beautiful yellow flowers in the early spring before the leaves come out. It's a wetland plant as well. We have northern arrowwood behind me as well. Uh, we have invasive multiflora rose uh, behind me as well, which has some red berries, which the birds do uh, eat uh, and transport throughout the uh, woodland. The Soil Conservation Service back in the 60s brought that rose in, thinking it was going to be um, helping with erosion control and along fences. Uh, it's become the scourge of every wetland scientist because we have to cut our way through it sometimes. Uh, we have some high bush blueberry growing right on the, the side of the little stream here. Uh, and we have some common winterberry behind me as well. Uh, this is again a scrub shrub swamp because it, we don't have an overstory of tall mature trees in here. We have more more shrub uh, layer here and we have sensitive fern as well I believe I saw some oh and a really interesting plant uh, on this side of me we have it's called tussock sedge it's a really interesting plant that likes to have its roots in the water as well uh, in this stream we have some underwater plants as well growing and they're nice and green this stream may be a perennial stream, which means it runs year round. Our next stop is going to be in a pine woodland. Looks like we've come to another wet area. Uh, yes, this is an isolated vegetated wetland under the local bylaw. It's got water. Uh, it's not larger than a quarter acre foot, doesn't hold a quarter acre foot of volume. So it's not an isolated land subject to flooding under the State Wetlands Protection Act. But it's got a possibility of being a vernal pool. I've looked at it in a, for a couple of years now and I have not seen any macroinvertebrates. Um, I have not seen any toad or uh, frog or salamander egg masses in it as well, although I think it's on some list of a, a, being a potential vernal pool. It's a low-lying area that's close to the groundwater with a very large white pine forest around it. Wow, look at that white pine. It's huge. It, it, mu it must be hundreds of years old. It's probably 150 years old in mature forest here. It's got four large trunks, and it's a very big tree. Why don't we go over to the white pine forest next? All right. So we're at the edge of the uh, white pine forest, and it looks to me like we've had an incredibly good mast year about 10 years ago. In this opening here, we've got uh, white eastern white pines. Um, they're called shrub story, and they're almost sapling story, and they're eye, eye height and, and above and they have a very, very high number of these eastern white pines in this area. They'll, they'll self-prune eventually. What is meant by a mast? Oh, a mast is the seeds, acorns and, and uh, pine cones and things like that. Um, we're going, walking by a red cedar here, which was overcome by shade. It was in a field at one time, but uh, it died because of the shading impact to it. We're walking through the, the white pine forest here. White pines usually have very, very nice um, soils that infiltrate water very well. Over to this 
snag here. A snag is a standing dead tree. And if you'll notice, um, we've got some uh, we've got some holes in the trees. Somebody's living in this tree, uh, and this tree was probably dead probably for the last 10 or 12 years, and it's providing very, very good habitat uh, for all kinds of wildlife. Notice there's very little shrub story in this pine forest uh, because of the shading, most likely. Um, we're also looking at a couple of a couple of oak trees in the middle, but that oak tree is is a snag these days, and there's one black cherry as well. Why do all these pine trees live in this one area of the woodland? Again, it's a perfect place for them to grow because of the the very um, good soils for them. They like to have their roots go down into soils that where the water moves very fast. Good. Um, and I think what we should do now is go take a look at the vernal pools. As we head toward the vernal pool among the birches, we pass out of the tall pines and along a wooded path where we see witch hazel still in bloom. After passing a vernal pool, we come to an esker which is a long, narrow, raised line of earth, small stones, and sand left by the glacier. As we descend from the top edge of the esker, we come down to an old road cut through the hillside. Next, we follow a path between two bodies of water and head up through the field to our final destination. Well, we've come to an interesting woodlands here. Uh, yes, indeed. It's all American beech forest with one or two old uh, snags of other things here. Um, we Right behind us is a vernal pool. It's inside an esker, which is an ice channel filling that splits. And there's another vernal pool behind us even further. The esker is formed either at the top of a glacier in a crevasse or at the bottom of a glacier in, in an ice channel, <clears throat> which is a river channel. And so all the stones and gravel and fine materials follow the, that river's channel or the crevasse. And then when the glacier stopped and when it dumps its load, it dumped it like this. Now, most likely, in the vernal pool area, there was a huge ice cube there. And then all the, all the fill around it filled in. The beech trees here are in well-drained soils and they are allopathic, which means they have a chemical that they, they exude in their roots that doesn't allow other trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants to germinate. This concludes our trail walk for today. This has been quite an adventure, Steve, and thank you for sharing your information with us. Until next time on Trails of Discovery. Goodbye.